Okay, good afternoon everyone and welcome to NI Network's first flexibility webinar. I'm Edel Creary, I'm Head of Communication and Stakeholder Engagement and I'll be facilitating today's webinar as we talk about this really exciting project called FLEX. And it's exciting because it has the potential to put downward pressure on all customers' bills, to uh, put revenues back into local communities and businesses, to minimize disruption and outages and to really support low carbon technologies and deliver faster network solutions. But we're very much a trial stage and as we develop our plans and as we shape the project, we'll do so very much based on the feedback that we receive from our customers and our stakeholders. And today is very much part of that. This is your event and we'd like to invite viewers to get involved in the discussion both today and via the Q&A session and hopefully on a one-to-one -one basis even over the next few days, um, weeks and months and we'll explain how later on. So we've a lot to get through in the next hour. Uh, first you'll be hearing from Roger Henderson, Network Asset Director at, at NI Networks and he'll set the scene. And then we're very privileged to have two great panellists. The first will be Randolph Brazier from the Energy Networks Association and he'll share his insights today just in terms of how this has worked in, in GB and, and what we can learn from that. Then Randolph will we'll move over to Tanya Headley from the Utility Regulator and she'll share her thoughts especially around the importance of engaging and powering and enabling customers on a project such as, such as this. Then we'll move to Jonathan Pollock, Network Development Manager and Cormac Bradley from our Future Networks team and both will talk about our innovation projects and what this project is, is really all about. And then finally, there will be a Q&A session at the end where we can address some of the questions that you raise. So just in terms of housekeeping, there's a huge number of attendees today, which is, which is great, about 230 uh, at last count. But it just means that we've had to put everyone on to mute and, and you will remain on mute for the duration of the event. But we do want to hear from you. So as we go through the session, we're asking you to, to submit your questions through the Q&A function, not the chat function, but the Q&A function. Uh, the team here will be gathering those up and we'll answer what we can today. But what we can't answer today, we will follow up on separately after, after the event. And although you're very much invited to submit questions, we also want to hear from you in terms of any ideas that you think that we should consider as part of our future plans for, for FLEX. And as I mentioned, you're, you're very, this is, is your event. So we'd like to hear your contributions there. And then finally, we're recording this webinar and that's simply so that it's available for, for others in the future. And we, we may put this on our, on our website. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to Roger Henderson, Network Asset Director. Thank you. Good afternoon. Everyone, I'd uh, just like to extend the Adele's word of welcome for everybody that's joined the webinar today to hear more about our FLEX project. Our FLEX project is one of six innovation projects that we're currently trialling to support the development and operation of a more flexible network. I'll leave Johnny to elaborate more on this later in the session. But the purpose of these innovation projects is to develop and implement new ideas with enduring benefits for our customers and our communities. These ideas will help enable a low carbon Northern Ireland powered by clean electricity. We know that we need to collaborate extensively with stakeholders to deliver these benefits to customers. So I'm delighted to see the interest, the level of interest in the webinar today. Fundamentally, flexibility is about reducing loads in the network by using the customer's ability to change usage patterns by either switching on generators or reducing consumption. Managing peak load through flexibility helps reduce cost to all customers because it means we don't necessarily have to look at investing in a permanent upgrade to meet a temporary spike in demand. Times are changing. The transition to a low carbon economy is one of the biggest changes in our history. The drive towards a net zero carbon future is creating significant growth in the adoption of low carbon technologies connecting to the network. Renewable energy sources, electric vehicles, electric heating, and energy storage are placing new and increased demands on our network. Increasingly, customers will have the ability to produce their own electricity and to take more control over how they use and supply electricity. That's all really positive, 
but it means a major change is required in how we manage and operate the network. At NIE Networks, we are developing the network to become more flexible to the changing demands and greater variability in renewable generation. And that's where this FLEX project comes in. The launch of this flexibility trial is exciting as it marks a key milestone for us and our plans to transition to more decentralized, smarter, lower carbon network. The transition is already well underway. We've connected over 23,000 generators to the distribution network with now 47% of electricity consumed being generated from renewable resources. This is a significant shift from the historic centralized generation model on which the networks were principally designed. While developing the network to accommodate such levels of renewable generation within a relatively short time frame has only been achievable with the collaborative efforts of a number of players across industry, it's only a precursor to the pace of change that is to come. In December 2020, the Climate Change Committee announced and its sixth carbon budget in which they recommended that 60% of the necessary emission reductions by 2050 will be needed to be achieved by 2035. This comes in wake of the UK government's 10 point plan for a green industrial revolution, which includes its intention to ban the sale of petrol and diesel vehicles in 2030. While our own local strategic energy framework is currently under development, the context of these wider climate change ambitions signals the need to substantially decarbonize a number of sectors. This will have a significant impact on the way in which we design and operate our networks over the next decade. Our electricity network are fundamental to helping achieve our low carbon ambitions, and we need to be much more agile moving forward in terms of both the development and the operation of the network if we are to meet these challenges. We need to be ahead of the curve, not behind it. I think there's one thing that most of us all can agree upon, and it's that the customer is an integral part of the energy transition. As our networks and energy systems continue to evolve, it is essential that we remove barriers to participation. We're keen to hear your views. What do we need to do to make FLEX more accessible and understandable? Are there any further issues that we need to consider as we finalize our plans in this area? We appreciate there'll be a lot of new information presented today, but we'd welcome engagement during or indeed after this webinar. We have all a role to play to ensuring that the energy transition delivers enduring benefits to customers and communities. Today is a major step in that process. Thank you, Helen. Thanks, Roger. And we'll go straight over to Randolph Brazier. Randolph is the Director of Innovation and Electricity Systems at the Energy Network Association. Thanks, Randall. Thanks, Adele. Thank you for the introduction and good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're well. My name's Randolph and I'm Director of Innovation at a company called the Energy Networks Association. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about our open networks project and flexibility markets in GB. So I think if someone could move to the first slide, please, that would be great. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so at the ENA, we represent all of the gas and electricity networks in the UK and Ireland at both transmission and distribution, and that includes NIE networks. So you can see in red at the top there, you've got our electricity members, and then in yellow at the bottom there, you've got our gas members. So I think you heard from Roger some of the challenges that we're facing uh, at the moment in across across the whole of the UK. And I think one stat for me really brings that out. And that is the fact that across the UK now we've got over 30 gigawatts of distributed generation connected to those DNO networks. And the amount of other distributed energy resources that are being connected is rising rapidly. So we've got things like a lot of heat pumps being connected, a lot of battery storage, and also electric vehicles, um, particularly the, up, the uptake rate is really high on these. So this means the grid, the, the nature of the grid is changing significantly. If we could move on, please. Thank you. So to address these challenges, we set up a project across all of our electricity members um, in, in the UK and Ireland called the Open Networks Project. 
And this project is effectively, you can think of it as effectively the strategy for delivering the smart grid across our networks. And as Adele indicated in her introduction, the, the aim effectively of, of delivering the smart grid and um, pro promoting and using flexibility is to help reduce bills for customers and also help customers with flexible resources realize new value, new revenue streams. So in GB, this project is a, a, key, um, a key part of our regulator's smart grid policy. And it also has sign on from Bayes, the uh, energy department. But the project is very much not a theoretical project. We're taking a learn by doing approach. Uh, we are learning by running a range of different um, flexibility markets across GB, which we'll talk about. We're running a range of innovation pilots and innovation trials. We're running a range of uh, collaborative projects across T&D to understand what works and what doesn't physically on the network with real customers, and then bring that learning back into the Open Networks project to help realign the strategy um, and make sure that it's it fit for purpose for customers. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you very much. So, as I said, we've got 30 gigawatts of DER connected. Around 85% of that is renewables, uh, mainly uh, solar and wind. But more and more of that DER is becoming flexible, uh, which we believe is critical to achieving net zero. So what do I mean by flexible? Well, it effectively means the ability to control or schedule your demand or your generation. And this can really help networks both at a national level from a, from a frequency perspective, from helping balance the network, but also from a local level in terms of relieving congestion. So in GB, all of our networks have signed up to the flexibility commitment, which is effectively where they're committing, where there's congestion in the network, the networks have committed to procuring flexibilities from customers ahead of reinforcement if it's cost effective. So if it's effectively cheaper than that reinforcement. And they've committed to do that for all significant congestion in the networks going forward. Um, that means uh, at all voltages as well. So we're procuring flexibility right down to LV now, you know, individual blocks in London are going out to tender. If we could move on, please. Thank you. So what are the six steps? I'm not going to go through each of them in detail, but effectively they represent the customer journey. They represent the steps that a customer would take to understanding what flexibility is, seeing where the needs are and then providing it. So we, we have things like common products that we're procuring. We have common ways of making those products visible so that people can see what we need and where. We are standardizing the procurements and dispatch uh, arrangements and methodologies for how we use that. So we've got a common evaluation methodology now where we compare the costs of flexibility versus traditional reinforcement. We've got a single flexibility contract for all of the six GB DNOs, and we'll be extending that contract to the ESO going forward. So there'll be one flexibility contract. Uh, we're looking at common ways to dispatch those services and, and then settle it ultimately as well. And quite critically, we are also being open and transparent and consistent in how we report all of what we're doing across all of those different steps in the customer journey. So we're consistent in how we report the need up front, but then how we actually report what we have procured and where. And there's a section on our website, uh, you can see the link on that page there, where you can go there and you can look at all of the stats for what we're procuring, where, you know, how much things are being utilised, etc. So we, we call that section of the website flexibility in Great Britain. It's effectively a single entry point for providing flexibility services. We have the flexibility commitments there that I just talked about. We've got the definitions of the four real power products that we're procuring. We've standardized four real powered products. 
the networks are starting to dabble in reactive power procurement, but we haven't standardized products yet on that. That's one of the next steps. And as I said, it's got all of the figures on that page as well, broken down by uh, product type, DNO type. Um, we have, you know, how many hours you need to provide it for, what the capacity is, and then what the utilization is once it is used. We've also got national grid flex flexibility, so transmission flexibility figures on there as well. In terms of the size of the market in GB, we put two gigawatts out to tender last year across the six DNOs. Finalising the stats at the moment, but we estimate that we procured somewhere between 50 and 60% of what went out to tender. So we, we got that, you know, we, we didn't get all of what we needed, but we got 50 to 60%, which was a significant increase from the year before, which is where we only got 20 to 25%. And I'll talk about some of the reasons for why we didn't get all of that, what we need in a second. Uh, on that page, you've also got the flexibility timeline and the links. So you've got all of the DNOs, when they're putting, uh, when they're going out to tender for services, the links of how you can bid in, where you need to go to to find information, etc. And now that NIE Networks is is obviously joined the party as well, we hope to include um, Northern Ireland on this page going forward. So it'd be flexibility in the UK, which would be fantastic. Uh, if we can move on to the next slide, please. Thank you very much. So as I said, we're getting, yeah, we're getting circa 60% of what we need. Um, and that's highly locational. So in some areas, we're getting more than 100% of what we need. So let's say we put out one megawatt to tender in a certain area. In some areas, we're getting more than a megawatt of bids back from various different flexibility resources, which is great. However, in other areas, we get nothing. We're literally going out to tender and we're not getting any any interest back or, or we're getting a bit of interest but no one really ready to provide the service so we we really need to increase liquidity in these local flexibility markets and there's an there's a range of different ways that we can increase the liquidity it is highly locational and you know in some areas there's just no flexible resources you can't do too much about that at this stage however we are looking at making the products common so as I said we've got common real power products now and we will hopefully have common reactive power products in the future we're getting better at making um, the need the, the flexibility need easier making it easier to access easier to understand better user interfaces etc as I said we have standardized the contract terms now for the DNOs we're removing as much exclusivity as possible on the services so that people can stack services across different markets and it doesn't preclude them from playing in other markets because at the end of the day, if you're talking about an LV flex market, the value is not going to be that high. So to make the business case work for the flexibility asset, the investor or the operator needs to participate in multiple different markets, including obviously tra trading in the wholesale market. Consistent reporting and monitoring, I think I mentioned. Lowering barriers to entry. So we're trying not to be sizest, for example. Um, we're letting, you know, the other day we broke the record, I think it was a few months ago now, but we broke the record in terms of the smallest asset that we procured a service from. It was 600 watts. So that's tiny. It's like a, like a small battery, basically, computer battery or something like that. We are better coordinating with the TSO, as I said, and wider energy markets. We're also trying to unlock residential flexibility of the, of the sort of circa 1.2 gigawatts that we contracted last year. The vast majority is from industrial and commercial customers, not much at all is from residential uh, properties. Uh, but obviously stakeholder engagement and market coordination is critical. Just teaching people about these markets, getting them to better understand what they are, how they work, what the value is, how they can participate, et cetera, is absolutely critical. And that's why we do sessions like this with our stakeholders to try and get people to understand what we're doing and understand that this is a new revenue stream that they can stack on top of their business model. And it may help you get a project over the line. It, it may help it get get promoted and get connected. So I think that was all I was going to say today. I'll be joining the Q&A session later. Um, so look forward to your questions. Thank you very much for listening.
Thank you very much, Randolph. That was really interesting. It's particularly the fact that there's there seems to be a disparity between the various areas in terms of take up. And as you say, it's very exciting that Northern Ireland is now joining the party. So, um, but clearly that will have a big impact on, on consumers. So um, at this point, I'll hand over to Tanya from the Tanya Headley from the utility regulator to give us her views. Okay, well, thank you to LA Networks and thank you, Adele, for the opportunity to speak at the launch of this very exciting initiative. I have to say, I'm quite glad that Randall put a few links in there. I'm going to look through that myself later. I'm going to also talk briefly on the value of initiatives like this to address the challenges we're facing and how important it is that we ensure energy consumers are at the centre of this work by engaging, enabling and empowering them. Firstly, some important context. I'm sure many of you are aware of the work the Department of Economy is currently undertaking to set policy for energy in Northern Ireland in line with net zero for 2050. The utility regular are working closely with them on this. However, we're not waiting for the final policy. We want to do everything possible to allow Northern Ireland to meet the challenges that has been set, all in line with our duties set by government. There is no doubt investment will be needed to reach our net zero target. As bills increase, consumers need to see the value for them and have ownership of this net zero ambition. We're all here because consumers want and pay for electricity. They should be the ultimate beneficiary of the zero carbon future. The pace of change of getting to net zero means that regulation has to keep up, facilitate and enable this change while always being mindful of protecting the interests of consumers. The energy transition needs to be consumer centric. It needs to be more than just words. It needs new energy consumer frameworks and protections for consumers in place. Trust in regulation and the energy transition is essential. We see this work by NIE Networks as an important step forward to meet the challenges we all face. Many of the companies we regulate will need to adopt a much more open and innovative mindset in thinking about supporting new technologies in a way that benefits consumers. Companies will need to move from a traditional asset-led command and control style of system operation to something smart and integrated. Our message is not simply about working together to build and support asset development and continuing to operate the system in a conventional manner. We need initiatives, initiatives like this one, which will be a useful vehicle for improving coordination across network and system operators and for delivering change as part of energy transition. It is a step change in efforts to open up the delivery of distribution network requirements to the market. It enables whole system requirements to be identified and acted upon efficiently in the best interests of consumers. And we are pleased that NI Networks and ENA have taken a proactive approach to delivering progress in this area. This innovation is needed in a time of change. As a regulator, we recognise that the energy revolution will bring forward new approaches, harnessing the power of cutting edge and disruptive technologies that will change everything. And we're up for this. We want to be the enabler of this change. We also accept the pace of change is accelerating. While we recognise the technology may sometimes outpace things, we hope to apply the necessary flexibility where there's a clear need and a clear value proposition to bring to the table. Our aim is to facilitate Northern Ireland consumers' transition to a low carbon future and to facilitate, facilitate a whole range of new smart energy technologies. I would ask you to also recognise that as regulators, we must maintain remain within our varies. We need to follow the UR legislative role. And it's worth noting that other regulators have had duties updated to align with government ambition. When it comes to costs, it's consumers who are paying and we need to see the value and what can be delivered for them. Evidence of value and transparency is essential. The culture of we know better is not acceptable. Affordability also needs to be considered. We want high quality service. We want an open, flexible and collaborative approach to consideration of new ideas and technologies that could have the potential to support the energy transition process. And I accept there are no easy answers to this. The aim is to reduce cost to consumers by the system operators contracting for flexible services alongside investment in innovative network solutions. This will help deliver the overall lowest whole system energy costs. As a regular, we're focused on what is needed for future networks. This is a part and parcel of our corporate strategy. We are engaged with DFE as they develop strategy. We're taking a path of least regrets on current price controls for flexibility for the future. 
we are focused on ensuring a consumer-centric process, bringing consumers on the journey, making sure they are engaged, enabled and empowered. And we want the companies we regulate to have a similar focus. Net zero is something we want to work to together to deliver. As a regulator, we intend to support good outcomes for consumers during the energy transition and build on the existing regulatory framework to support work of this nature during a time of change. We would encourage as many stakeholders as possible to engage with MIE Network's development work on flexibility. We welcome this launch and the work of MIE Networks is undertaking both here and other areas, and we'll continue to work with them to deliver for consumers in Northern Ireland. I look forward to seeing how this trial progresses. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanya. It was really great comments. I want to hand over at this point to, to Jonathan Pollock. He's our Network Development Manager and he can talk about some of the, the innovation projects that hopefully meet the needs that, that Tanya uh, spoke about in, in her comments there. Consumer needs. Thanks, Johnny. Thanks, Adele, and good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's been great just uh, sitting here listening to some of the, the insights from the, the keynote speeches already. I just want to briefly touch on wider innovation within NIE Networks before I hand over to Cormac to, to focus in on the FLEX project. A, and I, I suppose to start off with, and, and this has been noted by the previous keynotes, just around the pace of change with regards to the energy transition. And as we all know, this is driven largely by uh, recent government announcements around net zero, the ban of the internal combustion engine sales beyond 2030, and the development of our own Northern Ireland energy strategy. And it's acknowledged both locally and further afield that this pace of change will require changes to the roles and responsibilities of distribution network operators like ourselves going forward. This change has often been coined the uh, transition from a dist distribution network operator to a distribution system operator. And over the last number of years, working hand in hand with the Energy Networks Association, we have conducted our own consultative process. And you can see on the left hand side of the screen that we've titled it Greater Access to the Distribution Network in Northern Ireland. And without going into too much detail on the outcomes from that uh, consultative process, we were given a clear steer by respondents that innovation is central to this transition. And on that basis, we have continued to engage with third party innovation projects here in Northern Ireland. Uh, many of you will be familiar with projects such as Girona and Roulette, and we look forward to working not only, not only in these projects, but other like projects going forward. Similarly, we have been progressing our own innovation projects within NIE networks, six in total in this regulatory period, and you can see that on the right hand side of your screen. These include, for example, smart asset monitoring, which is seeking to understand the potential of our assets to accommodate more demand or generation at times whenever the temperatures are a little cooler and the winds are a little higher. And these projects are really reaching a key juncture uh, this year whereby we'll be installing kit on the networks and trialing that kit and that technology over the next number of years. And I'd, I'd encourage you to, to find out more about the innovation projects through our Future Networks uh, link on our NIE Networks website. And you can keep up to date on, in, in terms of progress on those projects. But today in particular, we're very excited about Flex because this is the one project where we are reaching out to our customer base and we are asking the question, can you help us in terms of facilitating and helping us to manage the distribution network of the future? So at this point, I'll hand over to Cormac Bradley. Cormac is the Future Networks Engineer responsible for delivering Flex. I think it's fair to say, Cormac, that you've probably been living and breathing Flex over the last number of months. So I'll, I'll hand over to you at this stage, Cormac. Thanks, Johnny. And I'll just add my welcome to everyone here today. And it's great to see the the interest and and uh, that we, I suppose, believed was out there. In the next section of this presentation, we'll walk through what the Flex project is and, and the objectives, what our flexibility services are, and what we're looking to procure and, and how we plan to operate them. So. At its heart, and, and not to repeat what others have said before me, but flexibility is a reasonably simple concept, and we want to manage the load on our networks um, at, at peak times. And this is through engaging customers to be flexible with their consumption 
and really control that uh, in response to a signal from ourselves and then rewarding customers on the back end. Working with customers or parties acting on behalf, this is really addressing the source of congestion rather than simply building more network to accommodate it. And at the heart of this is our customers where they will all benefit through downward pressure and customer bills, as well as direct payments to participants and a series of supplementary benefits. Our Flex project itself has a central goal of understanding if flexibility is available out on the ground, and we believe it is. And then with that, developing the technical and commercial structures to use it effectively. Importantly, we recognise that this is new ground for NA Networks as, a, as an organisation, and so we must evolve and develop the internal processes to source and then use flexibility. All that we've done to date through this project has been guided by the principles on the screen making opportunities visible and accessible, creating processes that are simple and streamlined, creating a fair and level playing field for customers and technologies, and doing all of that in as open and transparent a way as possible. The first principle of visibility has guided us to use a platform like Piclo to publish our zones and requirements in, a, a, in an accessible manner for, for any member of the public to view. It's also why at the end of last week, we published our flexibility product specification on our website. And one of the key reasons why we're speaking to you today. These principles are only one of the ways in which the ENA and the Open Networks project has influenced our work. It's important to recognize the world leading work that is going on with Randolph and the Open Networks project bringing together all the network operators in GB along with ourselves to share learning, build relationships and drive that standardization of good practice. And I think it's fair to say that without that, we wouldn't be have been able to make the swift progress that we have and ultimately offer the customers in Northern Ireland the same opportunities and to experience the similar benefits to those in, in GB. So, to deliver these project objectives, we're delighted to say that on the 1st of February, we published our first ever flexibility trial zones in Piccolo. 17 zones in total that cover a geographic area that supplies almost 15% of all customers in Northern Ireland. Within those zones, we're seeking to procure just over 40 megawatts of active power or real power services, and this, these range between 1 and 10 megawatts in the zones, and represents 35 gigawatt hours of either availability or utilization opportunities. We're looking for three different flexibility products, and that's to ensure a broad and comprehensive trial and data set that we can analyze and build from in the future. And I'll talk about those products in the next couple of slides. Finally, we're making up to just over half a million pounds available for participants as part of this trial, all in a bid to open up local flexibility markets here in Northern Ireland. We've designed three separate flexibility products, and you'll find that there's one per zone. And they've been designed very closely to align with the Open Networks projects and, and those in GB. The first on the left-hand side is Sustain, and this is a product where providers will be given a pre-agreed delivery schedule from the outset and expected to deliver this without any further instructions from NIE. All delivery will be guaranteed, and so it provides a high degree of certainty for both the providers and NA networks in the network. Our second is a secure product, and it's a pre fault product that namely acts to secure the network ahead of any potential congestion. And this comes with at least 24 hours notice for providers based on network forecasting capabilities that we're developing. This notice offers a number of benefits, including allowing to provide providers time to react and adapt to these instructions, and if there are market participants, to tweak any of their positions that they might hold. Finally, our dynamic product is our post-fault product, where if we were to experience a fault in the distribution network, we look for a rapid response for providers, expecting flexibility to begin to be delivered within three minutes. As with secure and dynamic, their use is driven by network conditions, they do have a degree of uncertainty about their activation, and accordingly, we have a component of availability in their commercial structure. 
But across all three products, we do pay for the energy or the flexibility delivered through a utilization payment. All of these products have different commercial and risk profiles for both the provider and the network. And we want to analyze how they're received and perform during the project so that they can be deployed in a meaningful and sustainable way in future. I mentioned earlier on that our flexibility product specification, which we dive into a lot more detail than we'll be able to go into today, is on our website right now, and we encourage you to go take a look. The previous slide focuses on what separates and differentiates our products, but now what's common and what are the measures we've taken to minimize buyers to entry and promote participation. All of our products have the same low minimum bid size of 50 kilowatts, and this is an aggregate value, meaning that it can be comprised of assets of effectively any size. For secure and dynamic products, we have a minimum runtime of just 30 minutes, meaning that if a provider can be flexible with their consumption or generation for as little as half an hour, then there is the chance to participate. Metering is important, and it's how we measure performance and ultimately make payments. And we've set our minimum metering requirements to half an hour. But if more granular data is available, then we will happily accept it. Finally, our testing arrangements are streamlined and we have different options for communicating with providers depending on their capabilities and we do recognize the short duration of, of the trial. At the end of the project, every aspect of these products and the measures that we've put in place to promote accessibility reviewed and feedback from our participants and key stakeholders will be at the heart of this process. Some useful trial particulars are that the contract will initially be for a year and within that there'll be a six month service period with all bar one of the zones beginning in October of this year. While tailored to meet NA network specific needs, we have adopted the ENA's common contract that Randolph mentioned earlier. And it was a key output from the Open Networks program in 2020, keeping us in line with our GB counterparts. As many um, on this webinar will already have observed on PICLO, we define service windows on a daily basis. And outside of those windows, there's no obligation on providers. This approach of only procuring services for a portion of the day is efficient and it reflects the typical network conditions where peaks are reasonably predictable and occur within certain windows during daily life. It's also important that we note that the flexible capacity bid in by providers is committed for the, the service period, the, the contract period, and we're not operating a mechanism to readily declare availability. The next thing that we thought we'd take a look at is how we a value flexibility, but I've no doubt that this will evolve over time. Simply put, the value of flexibility can be seen in the value of deferring network investment. So by way of an example, if we were to defer, if the value of deferring an investment was say 10 pounds, and after a tender exercise, the cost of flexibility for that year was five pounds, then at a basic level, it's cost effective to use flexibility and the savings will be shared back with the wider customer base. However, obviously, if flexibility is more, cost more costly for the total number of megawatts and megawatt hours we're looking for, then it makes more sense to invest in network so we would not contract flexibility services. In this way, flexibility has an intrinsic price ceiling that above which it is more economic to invest in the network. And so for us, it's not a case of flexibility at all costs, but flexibility where cost efficient. Turning our attention to our tender now that the, the published zones are the first step of, it is a very traditional approach. And right now we've published our zones and requirements in PECLO and we're inviting flexibility providers to register their assets before the 5th of March. Now is the time to register your assets and please do not wait for the last minute. And rather than providers trying to verify where the location of their assets are, please allow ourselves and Piccolo to do this. There's no commitment at this stage and it will avoid anyone missing out on any opportunities. We'll then be progressing through a qualification where we vet organizations for technical and commercial compliance and then into a competitive tender. 
We'll also have to verify the capability of providers and their capability to deliver the services ahead of when we expect to commence in October this year. Now, I would note that these dates are all indicative at the moment and they are subject to change, but they should give a feel for the pathway ahead. And of course, if there are any changes, we'll notify. One element of flexibility that has rightly so relieved of received a lot of questions is our interaction with other markets and revenue streams, such as the wholesale energy market. And before we say anything else, flexibility services are open to absolutely everyone. You do not need to be a market participant or a balanced responsive party. And if you are one of those, you're not constrained to your registered asset portfolio. In terms of our interactions with other markets, we're keen to see providers stack the value of their assets. And as part of the trial, we want to understand and analyze any conflicts and where they might exist, where they are material, material and where they are sometimes just simply perceived. In order to understand this, you won't find any exclusivity clauses in our contracts. Fundamentally, providers are responsible for managing all their own commercial obligations. Through close stakeholder engagement, this approach has been really welcome and pathways to avoid any conflicts and spec revenues have already been identified. In many cases, it's as simple as ensuring that you're generating at the right time in the right place. Throughout this project, we've been working with our colleagues in TSO through our agreed work program and both sharing the learnings and findings for any future development of flexibility services to ensure that they are a sustainable proposition. As a penultimate slide, performance and settlement is relatively straightforward. As I mentioned earlier, our tender exercise will be competitive and will be inviting bid prices for utilization and for the secure and dynamic products a bid for availability. And successful tenders will be paid as they bid. We'll be calculating a baseline for every asset from meter data provided from the previous 12 month period. And this will be used as a benchmark by which we measure performance. Payment itself is straightforward and made up of the components of utilization and availability as necessary. Utilization being for the energy delivered to the network or indeed not consumed and availability for reserving the capacity or availability for any networks to use. And there will be performance scalers applied to both to promote conformance with NA networks instructions. I finish now by really saying this is the beginning. Our Flex project trial is a first step into flexibility services and we've been as pragmatic as possible. The learning that we glean from this trial and the feedback from our participants and stakeholders will drive the direction of flexibility services in future across all aspects. And that includes the volume of opportunities, the design of our products, the terms and conditions, and indeed the information that we publish. We look to continue to wait ways to facilitate greater participation and increase awareness of flexibility opportunities. And we look forward to continue an ever closer cooperation with our colleagues in the TSO through agreed work programs. Finally, a word of thanks to Tanya and, and the UR for their support in us, EA Technology for their professional services and the leader stakeholders for their openness and receptiveness to any proposals and plans that we have put forward. So with that, I'll hand over now to Andrew Couples, who's going to chair our question and answer session. And I look forward to hearing and answering any questions that you might have. Okay, thanks Cormac. Um, yeah, there's a number of questions coming in, so um, I'll try and um, divvy them out between the various different ma members of the panel here and try and get through as many as possible in the, in the time we have left here. Um, so I suppose I'll maybe kick off um, um, probably back to Cormac on this one, just, um, just for clarification. Um, can sites apply directly to participate in Flex without having to operate via existing aggregators? Um, you maybe take that, Cormac, and also just then uh, related to that, how do participants um, see, how do they find out whether they're in one of these trial zones and, and how do they go about registering them? Okay, so in terms of a, a site that's 
um, is potentially in contract with a, another third party for its operation. Um, we would obviously advise that anything you do does not breach those contracts, so certainly uh, contacting the aggregator. Um, but that would really be, a, a, I suppose, a participant decision to make. In terms of the knowing if whether you're in a zone or not, Effectively, that's what we're one of the benefits of using Piccolo platform, and they will provide a geographic uh, verification. Then, whenever that information is passed through to NA networks, we will provide a final call based on the location of the asset's meter point reference number in respect to the network, and that will be done at the pre-qualification stage. So, obviously, only assets that can provide flexibility services will make it through to the competitive tender. Just on that point as well, and uh, this was a message through from Pictou that they have noted that there's a large number of new providers registered from Northern Ireland, and they are planning a, a provider webinar in the coming weeks, so I recommend keeping an eye out for that. Okay, um, thanks Cormac. Um, there's one here, um, maybe for Randolph around, is, would we have an indication of the total market value of the flexible market um, up to the end of 2020? And I suppose that's across GB. Um, and maybe a wider question than that, for maybe for yourself, Randolph, and maybe if Tanya wants to come in around, you know, what's the longer term outlook for flexibility? And it's, it's maybe about a crystal ball, but you know, out to 2030, 2050 type timescales. Yeah, so it's a good question by whoever asked that. So I think the first thing to note is that the the value is highly locational. As you can imagine, the cost of a constraint in central London is very different to that of a constraint in a low density rural area, for example. So the value is very quite significant geographically. Similarly, the value varies greatly across voltages, as, as you can imagine, uh, and also the different services themselves. Um, the, the four real power products we have and the reactive power that we're starting to um, dabble with, uh, the values do vary across those. Um, so it's difficult to add up the values and also using the historical figures, we didn't have a common valuation methodology previously. Um, so hence, adding them up doesn't make a lot of sense because the methodology for valuing flexibility wasn't common across the networks. However, it is something that we'll look at going forward. So I'll be able to provide maybe one figure in the future. However, I'm not going to just leave you hanging. I'll give you some averages, which might be quite useful. So um, as, as Cormac said, you've got typically, not for all services, but for most of the four services, you've got an availability fee and a utilization fee. So availability fee is just when you're ready at any point in time, but not necessarily um, dispatching. The value for that that we've seen on average, it's circa five to 10 pounds a megawatt hour, somewhere in that range, roughly. Uh, and then for utilization, so this is when you're actually called on to turn up or turn down. Again, this is very much an average value, but the kind of average value that we're seeing is around about 300 pounds a megawatt hour. Um, so that is, that is significantly larger than the wholesale energy market, but obviously the volumes uh, are less, but it, but it, is, it is a decent it is a decent chunk, basically. So in, to answer your second question then, Andrew, on what's the future, um, we very much see these markets as increasing in size. Um, in, in GB, I'm not so sure about NI, but in GB, the distribution networks are designed roughly on average, assuming that every household is one to two kilowatts. That's how average design assumption or it has been historically um, so you know you can imagine if you're putting in a seven kilowatt ev charger in each house and potentially electrifying heat because 87 percent of people in gb have gas um, you know and a, a heat pump could be anywhere from two or three kilowatts up to 15 depending on the size and, and quality of your house you can see that there's going to be a lot of congestion potentially in the networks and hence a lot of a need for flexibility going forward. 
so that we can keep the costs down. So I, th I see it as significantly growing going forward. In relation to flexibility now and in the future, um, I, I'm not sure how many of the people on this call are aware of this, but I'm presuming and hoping most are that the Department for the Economy has been working on a new energy strategy for Northern Ireland. Um, they had a call for evidence and received quite a substantial number of responses, I think somewhere around 160. Their current plan is to uh, consult on a proposed energy strategy by the end of March and have a new strategy in place for the end of the year. And obviously we're working on them with that. But uh, irrespective of their strategy and, and the form that takes, it's very clear that flexibility is, is a necessity for us going forward uh, in terms of delivering energy transition and net zero carbon. So these sort of initiatives at NIE and NIE, NEA are done it are essential. We, we can't wait until the policy is formed. We know this will add value and we're very keen that this does progress and, and crystallizes into something that can be used in the future for delivering both for uh, consumers and for the industry. Thanks folks. Um, there's a question there that came in slightly earlier on around innovation trials and Randolph talked about what was happening in GB and what was happening in NI. I think Johnny covered covered that off, but um, you know, if you go to our website, the Future Network section of our website, there'll, there'll be some more detail around that. Um, there's another question here around tariffs and how, how do tariffs play into this to incentivize things like EVs and heat pumps to shift their demand um, and, and how that plays into um, dispatching more wind energy and that sort of thing, I suppose. Um, I may make a brief comment on that. I suppose flexibility is one of a number of things that we can do in our toolkit um, and, and tariffs is a different thing that we can also um, potentially use. Obviously network costs are just one part of the tariff and maybe Tanya, you want to comment there as well. There's, um, I think yes. we've been looking yep. at and the regulator have been looking at um, reforming the tariffs. Uh, we, we are starting work on a review of the uh, network tariffs and, and how they need to be developed going forward. It's clear that it's important that uh, people are paying the appropriate cost. And we are aware that there are um, people now who are connected to the network. And if a tariff is based around um, your usage and not the capacity that you're holding, there is an element of are you paying the appropriate amount? So there is a, a, a quite a significant piece of work that needs to happen there. But you're, you're right, Andrew, it's not an NIE issue. It's a energy industry issue. Uh, suppliers are the people who ultimately um, structure the tariffs that they're offering to consumers. And this needs to be something that the regulator takes forward and is intended to take forward. But it'll be helpful that we have energy policy in place uh, to, to assist that in terms of Forming a, a direction of travel for policy that we can we can then um, take on board and move forward with. Thanks, Tanya. Um, a couple of questions here around um, domestic customers and and um, how they can participate with using the likes of domestic solar PV and and battery storage. Um, maybe Johnny or Cormac wants to come in there, and maybe then maybe Randolph could give us a bit of a view as to where GB is with that as well. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. I, I can come in here and I'll just really pick up on, on some of the points that, you know, uh, Cormac had made during his presentation in terms of the 50 kilowatt size uh, and that's the aggregate size. So, you know, we, we've tried to be as open and transparent uh, and remove as many blockers as possible to all customers participating in this. So a domestic customer who uh, meets our technical criteria uh, can very much play uh, within this market as part of an aggregate portfolio, as long as that aggregate portfolio is 50 kilowatts uh, or more. Uh, so, I, I mean, sort of uh, anecdotally, we, we have had some conversations and it appears like there will be some movement in this space, which is very encouraging. Uh, and at the end of the day, this is a trial uh, and it would be good to see as wide ranging uh, a portfolio as, as possible. Uh, and it'll allow us, you know, we'll take stock at the end of this trial and we'll consider that diverse mix of, of portfolio and participants and make a decision in terms of the longer term business as usual rollout of Flex uh, to try and encourage as much anticipation as, as possible. Uh, but Andrew, you, you mentioned Randolph. I'd be interested, Randolph, just from a GB perspective. It's very interesting just to hear about, I think you'd mentioned, was it 500 watts was the the lowest participant that, you, that you've seen very recently. So it'd be, it'd be very interesting just to hear some more about that. 
Yeah, so <laughs> 500 watts is the, uh, except, I think it was 600 watts, uh, very much the exception rather than the rule. Um, as I said, most of the customers have been industrial and commercial type customers in the hundreds of kilowatts to megawatts range. Um, so that, that was a, an exception. However, like I said, we do see a lot of untapped flexibility potentially in homes, but there's a few barriers to residential flexibility. I mean, one is the aggregation models are still fairly new. Um, the second one in, in GB, we have the supplier hub model which means that effectively everything goes via the supplier. The supplier's got the relationship with the customer. So we're trying to work with the suppliers so that the suppliers re effectively reflect these flex markets down to those residential customers. And then probably the biggest barrier, at least in our personal opinion, is, is the asset themselves. Um, residential customers have to pay um, potentially significant upfront capital cost um, to get these flexible assets in their homes, uh, which they don't necessarily have. I mean, I don't have any flexible assets in my home at the moment, for example. Um, so we need to come up with um, business models that work. Now, some suppliers are starting to come up with those models so that, that they significantly reduce or even remove the, the upfront capital cost. Um, but I think we need other ways to reduce that upfront cost before we truly untap uh, the residential flexibility. EVs will obviously help as well, but EVs are not at parity yet with traditional cars. So um, again, there's a capital cost there. But yeah, there's a few barriers, but it, it is a key focus of ours this year to try and help untap that residential flexibility. Thanks folks. Um... Couple other, I suppose, related comments. A couple, there's a couple of comments that have come in around um, maybe um, to enable some of that domestic participation may require the like of a smart metering program um, to allow participation similar to what's going on in, in GB and in the, in the south as well. Maybe let me ask Roger or Tanya again if they want to come in on, on that point. Um, Northern Ireland doesn't currently have smart metering program. Uh, with energy to evolve, we don't have a strategy. We don't have a smart metering program. It's something that I expect the, the department to look at as part of their energy strategy. We do have metering that allows for gathering half hour data and that also can be enabled to allow uh, remote access to that information. So there are ways to uh, deliver uh, the flexibility and consumers to engage uh, within the technologies we currently have without the rollout of a full smart metering program. And I would have thought that, well, I'm aware that um, some of the um, suppliers in Northern Ireland are currently looking at that in terms of providing possible new tariff offerings. So um, hopefully that will be something that people will consider when they're, when they're looking at um, their options of engaging with consumers uh, in their flexibility going forward. And I'm hoping people will not wait for a policy decision on smart metering or a full smart metering rollout when I believe we have the technology to do something um, effective here, which would cost substantially less money than a smart metering program. Yeah, so uh, Andrew, look, in terms of uh, the, the program, it'll, it'll not inhibit participation at, at this stage, but, you know, um, certainly, you know, in terms of the more visibility with time that customers have in terms of data, I think, look, it, it, it means for, for, for better engagement down the line. So, so um, certainly, you know, maybe the key question here is, look, it'll, it'll not inhibit participation at this point. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's the key point um, on that. Um, yeah, there's lots. There's lots of questions here. Some are in relation, you know, the technical details around the time scales of the products and the number of events. Um, I think Cormac touched on some of that, and you know, the, the website address is there. There's a lot more detail on our website, um, and we will also follow up um, all these questions to make sure they're all answered um, after the event. Um, I suppose just to pick out, there's a couple here, um, probably back to Cormac in terms of how this differs from existing DSU and DS3 and the capacity market um, and that sort of thing and how you know the interaction with the energy markets. I think you touched on that briefly. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. I suppose that the first differentiation is the use case. So 
the capacity market has its function for ensuring supply adequacy for the the country. Uh, demand say units is a is an energy market concept, um, and then this is obviously to resolve distribution network congestion and the funding streams that are available for the various uh, revenue streams there are, are different as well. But, but fundamentally, um, on a technical level, increasing generation or, or decreasing demand is the same uh, net outcome for the network. And that's, that's part of the reason you know, why we do feel that they are stackable. And um, particularly, you know, if, if someone is generating into the energy market and they have a distributed portfolio, and if they have to select which generators are going to be on, then uh, it might be the case that they can choose to have it in one of our zones and thereby provide the flexibility as well as fulfilling their, their commitment to uh, the energy market or, or whatever else. So with that, and I mentioned, you know, we're trying to understand these conflicts and I I can appreciate how um, at the outset, you know, it could be perceived and how do these go together. But really it's one of our trial objectives to understand whether that conflict that you perceive uh, see is, is perceived or whether it's actually a material blocker to procuring flexibility. Um, and certainly as a, as a starting point for a trial and a very first step into flexibility, um, it, it's a very prudent or uh, prudent approach to um, not dictate too much and to allow, I suppose, the outcomes to unfold and then we will uh, refine and, and adapt and evolve our offering in future as, the, uh, as more learning is available. Thanks, Cormac. Um, I'll try and I'll try and cover off a couple of these myself here. There's a question around um, who pays for any specialist equipment which may be required on site. And I suppose what we're saying is, you know, the price that you put in for the tender should basically include any, any required works for you to participate in that flexibility market, and we'll pay the availability and utilization, and that'll that'll be to cover um, all appropriate costs there. Um, there's a question here. I think I think this question is around maximum size, and it's around you know can transmission connected assets and that sort of thing um, play into this. I suppose as Cormac talked about, you know the nature of um, the constraints on the distribution network is that they will be very locational, and um, you'll see on if you go on to each zone on Piccolo, you'll see the voltage. There is a voltage limit, and it's generally either below 33 kV or below 11 kV. So it has to be a distribution connected assets um, that's within the zone. Um, I'll maybe just put this final one out there um, for anybody on the panel who wants to comment. Um, the question is around, will, will the flex trial consider the carbon impact of participants? Um, so the example given is, you know, someone could be firing up a diesel gen set to earn revenue from flexibility and yeah, what's, you know, obviously there's a carbon impact there. Yeah, Andrew, I, I can pick up this one then other people can come in. I mean, our, our position at the outset, considering that this is still very much a trial, is to remove, as I said earlier, all, all blockers and be technology agnostic. Uh, so there, to, to answer your question, there's no carbon pricing or carbon impact at this stage. But again, picking up on the point that this is a trial, we're looking to understand what is a portfolio of customers out there that, that have flexibility. And at the end of this trial, we can take stock in terms of the future direction of travel, should there be an element of carbon pricing and carbon, you know, uh, pricing within within the flex trials or within the flex BAU products, that's still to be decided uh, based on on the outcome of the trial. Yeah, we in in the UK, we're not allowed to discriminate on technology types, um, so we're also being technology agnostic, as Johnny said. Our split at the moment is roughly eighty twenty, so eighty percent is effectively gas and diesel gensets uh, and 20% um, demand side response batteries, renewables. Uh, but the regulator and um, the department, the Bayes, our, our energy department are looking into uh, carbon requirements of these flex markets going forward. But at this stage, it's tech agnostic. I can confirm that NIE also has obligations for non-discrimination in its license at this point in time. So that is something that I think we can all see the, the direction of travel and that's something that may be considered in the future. And obviously there'll be government policy in relation to diesel uh, in whatever form it's being used. So, um, but again, I, I reinforce what Jordan said about this being a trial and uh, it's very 
very welcome to see it, it moving forward. Okay, um, I think we'll leave the Q&A there. As I said, we'll follow up directly and get answers to all the various specific um, queries directly. Um, and I'll just hand back to Adele now to, to close it off for us. I'm sort of conscious, thanks Andrew, I'm sort of conscious we're eating into other people's time now. So thank you to our panellists. I thought that was excellent, really uh, great presentations and, and, and good Q&A. Um, the slides will be made available via the, the website at that, uh, the address that you can see there, NI Network Stroke Flexibility. And we'll also have the Q&A, uh, anything that we didn't get to respond to today will, will be up there as well. I mean, we, we heard a lot today. Uh, it's, it's encouraging that the other GB DNOs are, are a bit further on, and it's also encouraging that our regulator is, is so supportive of, of what we're doing here. So, so that's that's fantastic. And just to, to circle back to Roger's points at the very top of this uh, discussion, it's really important for us to understand what do we need to do to make Flex more understandable, but more importantly, more accessible to, to the widest pool of people possible. And are there issues that we need to consider as we finalise our, our plans? We've heard that, you know, the customer, the customer centric solution is absolutely critical. But as we design our plans, we need to keep our, you know, the customer in the room and, and hearing from our stakeholders and, and from you as, as consumers as well. All of that can, can only help. So thanks for your time and attention today. And We'll um, be updating the, the website over the next few days. And if you want to get in touch with us to have a one-to-one -one meeting, that's that's absolutely fine as well. Use that flexibility at ninetworks.co.uk address and, and someone will be in touch to make arrangements. Have, good afternoon, everyone. Bye.